today. I'd like for us to start by reading a verse from the Psalms. This is Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11. And it says, You have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand is perpetual splendor and delight. That's a nice thought, isn't it? When, when we're going through various circumstances and our minds are reacting by creating suffering for us, we can call this verse back to memory. You have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand is perpetual splendor and delight. And if we're not too far lost in the mind, just reading that verse, remembering it, can, can bring a faint sense of relief. It, it, it will usually be fleeting, but for that brief moment, our attention is taken out of our unhappy story, and, and it rests for a twinkle in time in the direction of peace and joy. But <clears throat> let's, let's taste this verse for a while. Let's savor its flavor. Let's enjoy its, its essence. Let's, let's embrace its life. You have shown me the path of life. Has God shown you the path of life? Now, the first reaction my mind has to that question is, of course he has. It's in the Bible. And the path of life is Jesus. Fair enough. But what does that mean? Well, the mind might say it means that I believe Jesus died for my sins and I asked him into my heart. I see. That ex explanation definitely fits very well into a mind-sized box, doesn't it? Now, I'm not suggesting that it's actually more complex than that. In fact, I'm suggesting that it just might be far more simple. Now, the psalmist didn't know the name Jesus. As, as we call it in our language. He didn't know our religious ritual of saying a sinner's prayer and, as we so often word it, asking Jesus into our heart. He did know about the destructive effects of sin. He did know about the forgiveness and the mercy of God. And he did know the path of life. You have shown me the path of life. And then it goes on to put it into words, the, the best that he can to put into words what the path is. In your presence is fullness of joy. Now, of course, our minds believe that salvation is the only way to enter God's presence. But consider a man or a woman who, who is in prison, who has just been set free. The prison door is open, and he walks outside. Now, where she wants to be, the place that she considers home, is somewhere on the other side of the world. And, and now he has the freedom to go there. His sins have been pardoned. Her debt has been paid. His freedom has been granted. But she is not home. Having your sins forgiven, having your debt paid, and having your freedom granted to you by God there is nothing more wonderful and, and game-changing. But the excitement dies down. The elation diminishes. 
the first love, as it's described in Revelation, grows old. Are you still standing in the street outside of the prison? Or have you come home? You have shown me the path of life, or you have shown me the way home. In your presence is fullness of joy. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, we read this. My brethren, consider it utter joy when you are surrounded by various adversities. Now, what do you suppose James meant there? Consider it utter joy when you are surrounded by various adversities. Are we supposed to somehow conjure up a feeling of happiness and delight? Or to produce it in our minds? Or, or perhaps we're just supposed to make a mental agreement to the thought that it somehow really is joy. I mean, surely we can't go beyond that, can we? Consider it utter joy. Yeah, <laughs> happy, happy, joy, joy, right? But seriously, d though, d does that resonate with the truth of God's nature? that he has engraved upon your heart? Is having some words go through your head really what we're supposed to learn from this? You know, Paul said the same thing several times. In fact, Paul wrote the most about joy when? While he was in jail. And even more so while he expected that his life would soon be over. And while he was surrounded by various adversities, he found true joy. Not a thought in the head. Not a feeling of fleeting happiness or a pleasure with his circumstances. But a deep peace from which he learned to live. And from that still peace bubbled an everlasting joy. You have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Okay, now... If you're waiting for instructions on things that you can do or things you can believe that will make you happy about everything, you're about to disappoint yourself. <laughs> there is no ritual. There are no beliefs. There is no system that can lead you to peace and joy. There is none. In fact, and this sounds really scandalous, but there is also no religion that can lead you to peace and joy. That's what the scripture says. Just a few verses after we are told to consider it all joy, James 1.27 says this, Religion, that to Father God is pure and undefiled, is this to help the widows and orphans in their trouble, and to keep oneself undefiled by union with the world. In other words, help those in need, and don't become identified with earthly things. That is the only true religion. It's not composed of a list of beliefs. All the doctrines you have learned and all the tenets you believe, 
They are not the true religion. Even if you believe some facts, they are not the true religion. <laughs> I told you this was scandalous. But it's right there in Scripture, isn't it? And when that was written through James, it actually wasn't anything new. Micah 6, 8 says this. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with the sovereign God. Do what is right. Love mercy. Sounds an awful lot like James 1.27, wouldn't you agree? Walk humbly with God. That's it. No list of things you have to believe. Just that. Help those in need. Do the right thing now. Embrace mercy. Let go of the things of this earth. Walk humbly, selflessly with God. There is no room for a sense of superiority there. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not downplaying the absolute need for the sacrifice of Jesus. He did not come in vain. But it's not our doctrinal positions that save us. It's not our mental beliefs that save us. It's not what we call the Christian religion that saves us. He already did it all. We cannot save ourselves, and none of these things can save us. And when the scriptures tell us that we must believe, Let's understand what this means. You probably know John 3.16 by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, we simply believe in him, right? Well, help me with this for just a moment. What does Scripture say about this in, in James 2.19? You believe there is one God, that is good. But even the demons believe and tremble. So, belief is not enough. Consider this. Someone, someone with severe mental defects might not be capable of believing what we consider to be the essential tenets of the faith. They might not make any sense to him at all. Is he therefore doomed to spend eternity in hell? What do you think? He might know that he sometimes does things that he shouldn't do. Guilt does not require an intellect to understand. Can he be forgiven? Can he be washed clean? Even if he doesn't formulate a mental belief and he doesn't list, uh, learn a list of doctrinal confessions? What do you think? Will Jesus save such a soul? Belief. Whosoever believes upon him. Now the word translated there as believe is not the same as our understanding of the English word believe. Instead, it means to trust in and rely upon, not just to accept in the head that something is true. Remember, who else believes in God? the demons believe. Whosoever believes will not perish. Now the demons don't have everlasting life. The demons do not trust in and rely upon God. So 
to lessen the mind's confusion. We could read that verse like this. For God so loved the world. He, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever trusts in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Do you see the difference there? This does not say that we must have all the right beliefs in our head. This says only that if we put our trust in God's Son, we have eternal life. That's it. Now the mind wants to start yelling at me and explaining why what I just said is not true. You have to believe this and that and the other. You have to do this or that or the other. It cannot just be a full surrender of the soul. It must be a list of physical and mental forms. And so the thief on the cross could not be saved. And the one with severe Mental handicaps cannot be saved. Now, we would not condemn either one of those, but without knowing it, we do. Just let that sink in for a moment. You have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. I wonder, do we even know what true joy is? Is it happiness? Is it liking our circumstances? Is it having fun? Or is it something deeper? Something that we can have in the middle of various trials? Something that we can have if we are unjustly in prison? Something that we can have even if we just got fired? Or evicted? Or abandoned? Or misused? Or abused? What is joy? Well, I can't tell you. No one can tell you. The Bible can't even tell you. The scriptures tell us that they can't tell us. 1 Peter 1.8 calls it joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable speakable. You just can't put it into words. Full of glory. <laughs> That's something else that can't be put into words. You see, true joy is not within the realm of the mind. So it, the mind can neither understand it nor explain it to others. You see, Joy is not a thing. Instead, joy is a state of being. And it starts with peace. As the scriptures describe it, true peace cannot be described. Rather, it is peace that surpasses all understanding. And Isaiah 26.3 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose attention is kept upon you because he trusts fully in you. Sounds kind of like John 3.16, doesn't it? Whoever trusts in him will not perish, but enters into fullness of life. Not in the future or in the sweet by and by, but now, 
Eternity can be in no other time because no other time exists. Eternity is always now. Yes, there are, are, are events that are prophesied, that have been told in, in the scriptures, and, and not all of those things have happened. But when they do happen, they will happen when? They will happen in the now. They can't happen, nothing can happen any other time. And that is where the life God gives us is. It is in you where you are, and it is there now. Does this make sense to you? So, we are kept in perfect peace when our attention is kept upon the great I am. You have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand is perpetual splendor and delight. Sometimes, just maybe, we think of God's presence as something that is absent. But if we just go somewhere we aren't, at a time that isn't now, then we will find fullness of joy and timeless splendor and delight. Let me ask you this. Where is God? He is in his temple, which means he is inside of you. When is God? He is present. He is fully present, which means that he is now. Now, it can make, make the mind feel a little lighter and a, a little more at rest and a little less negative to, to think about the sweet by and by and, and, and by the time in which we, wherever we think the presence of the Lord is. But for there to be God's presence, God must be present. And he is. <laughs> he is present right now. He can't be present any other time, can you? And as James 4, 8 says, when you draw near to God, what? He will draw near to you. God is fully present. So when you are fully present, you are where and when God is. In you, with you, now. And when you draw near to God, He draws near to you. Now this means that you are not lost in the mind. This means that you are not holding on to the stories and the forms of this temporary world. This means that you do not worship your beliefs or what you consider to be your religion. And it's so simple that few will be able to accept it. You mean there are no hoops for me to jump through? You mean I don't have to believe a list of ideas? You mean I don't have to wash my face and clean my clothes and get everything perfectly in order? Well, the thing is, you don't even have to believe what I've just told you. <laughs> you can hold on to forms of legalism and impure religion and still be saved from the hell that will purge all of those sinful things of the world. Yes, God will save the uneducated, the unintelligent, and those who don't believe in the things you do just as much as he will save you. You see, it's not about you. It, it never was about you. It's all about 
him. He did it all. And as you are present with what is, giving thanks, your presence with God's presence. In the here, where God is, and in the now, when God is, you will find that you begin to trust fully in Him. It's just something that happens when you are in that place. You can't not trust in Him when you're not lost in your mind, but you're here now with what is. <laughs> and you can see all those stories in, in the mind, but you know that they're just stories. They're just things that rise and fall, things that come and go. And you don't believe in them. And you will trust him. Blessed is the one whose attention is kept upon him here, now, that's where he is, because he trusts fully. And in this place, you will remain in perfect peace. And from this peace, you will know fullness of joy. And in this place of, of full honor with God, or at his right hand, you will dwell in the timeless splendor and delight of his glorious presence. And that is enough. <laughs>